What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. Welcome, bike, to the channel. This is BDGE Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas, and we are lined up for one final, last, very last full send on our mock drafts on underdog best ball. If you are cramming for your fantasy football league right now, I promise you the single best place to practice to draft is on Underdog Fantasy. You can either go to underdogfantasy.com or you can download the app, which will be linked in the description, the head of the comment section. It's very easy to find in the app store. Literally just type in Underdog Fantasy and you are there. Let's move my ass over. We are doing a 12-team draft, okay? 12 teams. This is half PPR. I don't know where I'm picking from yet. They will do it as soon as the draft fills. I'm going to throw this into Discord and let the homies in the Big Dogs Discord channel uh, fill up the rest of the draft. And then we will draft together, and we will go over all the breaking news that we've had over the last few days. We have Alvin Kamara and the contract dispute. We've got a lot of stuff going on in the fantasy football world, and a lot of you guys have drafts over this next weekend, so y'all need to know what to do. That's why I'm here for y'all. But again, the sharpest place to do your drafts. If you need if you need to practice for your draft, go to Underdog Fantasy. These are best ball drafts. However, you do pay to get into them, okay? You pay to get into them, $3. That's it. $3 to get the best practice for your single draft. Since people are throwing in $3, they are trying very hard, okay? So you're getting real life ADP. There's not defenses going in the eighth round, kickers going in the 10th round, because guess what? There aren't kickers and defenses in best ball thank god there's only quarterbacks there's only running backs there's only wide receivers and there are only tight ends oh this is perfect because i get to talk about kamara we're at the 104 beautiful so i'll be picking from the 104 the draft will start in i don't know 30 seconds i believe uh on dog you only pick these positions and each week it will start the best player at quarterback two running backs three wide receivers a tight end and a flex so it's a deeper league 18 rounds of this best ball draft and again it will decide who to start each week based on the best points scored in that fashion so get on underdog fantasy down the app on the app store and after you deposit 10 bucks make sure when that partner code page comes up like were you referred by anybody did anybody send them your way like I said, full send. I fully fucking sent y'all to Underdog Fantasy to prep for your draft. So make sure you throw BDGE in the partner code referral. So we're sitting at the 104. Draft kicks off in one second. Boom. So McCaffrey's going to go. Saquon's going to go. And then Zeke is going to go. And then I'm left sitting there wondering what's going to happen with Alvin Kamara. And I will break down in depth everything that I know. For you guys because that is a big topic of conversation a big discussion right now in the fantasy football world and there's very very much cause for concern so we have c-mac we have saquon and we have yep so i'm gonna go with derrick henry over alvin kamara my rankings have been updated in the draft guide so if you have the draft guide fantastic you can go see the updated rankings alvin kamara two things that concern me okay you have the contract situation so he had not been at practice for three or four days right not at practice we assume it's a contract dispute similar to joe mixon he's got these migraines going on right he signs that four-year extension four years 60 whatever the fucking contract was he signs it migraine goes away he's back at practice geo's giving him hugs all the boys are dapping him up you know they went from you know, all my homies hate the Bengals front office to we're one big, giant, happy family. Does Alvin Kamara get paid? I don't know. There was the rumor that came out that the Saints were open to trading Alvin Kamara. Now, Alvin Kamara and his agent did not request a trade. They did not demand a trade. They don't want to be traded. The Saints don't want to trade him either. They, I've, I've read a couple of reports, a couple of conflicting reports. One of them was that they are very much open to trade if the offer is well received if it's a lot that someone is packaging up for Alvin Kamara but apparently what they did was they were trying to show Kamara's side they were trying to show that what they were going to get in value was not there in the trade market so they were like we're not we don't want to trade you we want you to be part of this long-term deal however they've come out and said that they think Kamara is about as good as Christian McCaffrey is and when you say that and then Christian McCaffrey gets paid like he did guess what Alvin Kamara is going to come in and be like okay well you said I was as good as Christian McCaffrey. Pay me like Christian McCaffrey. That's the problem. $16 million. 
when you look at this contract situation with Kamara, the Saints have a lot, a lot, a lot of problems when it comes to cap space. They're going to be like negative a zillion dollars under the cap space for the next couple of years. And by under, I mean in the bad way. They don't have a lot of money to work with because Drew Brees, because they fucking signed Taysom Hill, he's going to be taking $16 million off the books. Ridiculous. But they have both of their really young stud tackles who are coming onto their contract extension soon. They're going to need to pay their tackles. They're going to need to pay Marshawn Lattimore. They're going to need to pay some of the players on the defensive. They have a lot of very good young players that they need to pay while also being in a hole money-wise. So does running back get the uh, get the focus of their contract extensions? Probably not. I don't know what's going to happen with Kamara. By the time you watch this, maybe they signed a deal that was $13 million a year. Apparently, they offered him the same deal as, I want to say, Derrick Henry, $12 million a year. But he wants more than that he wants either the christian mccaffrey level or somewhere between the 12 and what christian mccaffrey got and clearly they're not too happy about it however this whole contract thing is not what makes me nervous about alvin kamara they came out and said the reason that he missed the last few days of practice was because he got an epidural shot in his bike okay i've said this before and i will say it again i'm only technically a doctor all right i'm only technically a doctor so i'm going to give you my insight based on reading content watching content from the doctors within the fantasy space i'm going to do so after my pick is up so we've had the first eight picks were all running backs henry kamara cook clyde jacobs michael thomas austin eckler miles sanders joe mixon at the 112 Kenyon drake to one nick chubb to two uh, and then you got a run of wide receivers terry kill adams aaron jones julio jones travis kelsey and i'm going to be up at the 209 which is in a tough position you know i've talked about this spot before where i've come around to the terms that like most likely here uh, if you're getting the 101, 102, 103, you're not getting one of those elite tight ends. The tier of elite wide receivers drops off and you are reaching really, really far out for running back. So I've come to terms with the fact that I'm probably going to grab Chris Godwin at the back of the second round. I am still a huge fan of him. I think the Tampa Bay Bucks passing offense works through him as a full time slot receiver. He is going to see so many damn passes from Tom Brady. That being said, when he does move outside, he's still very good on the outside. Scotty Miller. I like Scotty Miller as a late round guy. I think Scotty Miller is going to be very, very good when they run three wide receiver sets. He's in the slot. Godwin and Evans are on the outside. But as they run two wide receiver sets, as they, you know, Bruce Arians came out and said that their 12 personnel, which is two tight ends, two guys on the outside, one running back will be their base offense. I think he said that last year and that wasn't really the case. But if it is right with Gronk coming in, they have OJ Howard, they have Cameron Brate. It's very possible they run a lot of two tight end sets, which means Scotty Miller won't be uh, on the field for that. So Chris Godwin, I like at the back of the second round. I also really uh, I'm warming up to the fact that I'm just going to take Lamar Jackson in one quarterback leagues if he falls to me at the 3-4, at the 3-2, at the 3-3. Um, it's just not a pick you're going to regret, even with the value all the way down there. And if you're on underdog drafting with me, again, the thing with taking quarterbacks early um, is you don't have the chance to hit the waiver wire. That's the best part about, about uh, best ball drafts, okay? So after we make our pick here, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean. I might even go crazy. A lot of times I like to stack. I've taken almost no shares of Mike Evans, which makes me a little bit nervous uh, because he could blow up in my face and I could stack Godwin with Mike Evans and get two dynamite players together. But I don't think I'm going to do that because I wouldn't do that in real life. So here again, I'm not reaching up for any of these running backs. I like Chris Carson a lot. He did say he was 100 percent healthy. So I do think in the third round you're getting a uh, pretty, pretty solid uh, value there. I think I'm actually going to go with Carson here now that the fact that he's back at practice, both Pete Carroll and himself are saying that he's 100%. The beat reporters are saying he looks good to go. Uh, I think that he's going to be someone who gets a ridiculous amount of volume there. So typically I would take a wide receiver like uh, the DJ Moore or the Allen Robinson or the Adam Thielen even up there. Uh, those are my three favorite guys in the mid to late third round. But since I did already go with a wide receiver in the second round, I thought I'd switch it up because if you're also new to the channel, you're cramming. We want to hit running backs early. We want to hit them early. We want to hit them often because at the end of the day wins over replacement. The guy who are legitimate league winners who win your fantasy league are always running backs. Yes, they might bust at a higher rate. They might be a little more unsafe, but the people who hit on the running backs are the ones that win your leagues. So the fact that I went running back then wide receiver makes me lean a little bit towards running back in the third round. Had I gone uh, running back, running back, I probably would have pivoted to a wide receiver rather than Chris Carson. Um, back to the Alvin Kamara thing, though. So got this epidural. I don't really know much about the epidural, but after watching Dr. Jesse Morse, after listening to Edwin Porras, after seeing, uh, I think it's Stefania Bell of the ESPN. Like everybody on Twitter that has any sort of medical background is nervous about this. Okay. 
So this could be for a non-serious injury. This could be for something that's whatever. It could heal on its own. But from what they're saying, an epidural shot is just a very... It's like throwing a Band-Aid over uh, a giant cut, okay? It is a very, very, very short-term fix. So this seems like it's going to be a problem throughout the year. And a lot of these Twitter threads, we have people jumping in and being like, I had an epidural shot and I was fine like a week after or whatever. Like, okay, sure, that probably fucking happened. However, you're not getting hit by 250-pound linebackers on a weekly basis. The problem is this is a short-term fix for some kind of back issue that I don't have more knowledge about, but... I just know that every doctor in the fantasy industry is concerned about this because if he gets hit the wrong way, which will happen on uh, a lot of the times he's on the field and getting the ball in his hands, he's going to get hit and it's going to happen often. Uh, One wrong thing can mess up the back. And you know, when players have back injuries, man, that shit is like the worst case scenario. I mean, you look at guys like David Johnson, we look at guys like Matt Stafford, Derek Carr, all guys who as soon as they uh, develop these back injuries, all of their explosiveness, all of their power, all of their like athletic ability that was in the elite tier is completely fucking washed off the face of the earth. So that being said, Alvin Kamara to me, both with the contract, the trade nonsense, which I don't think is that big of a deal, but the epidural in the back is really, really, really concerning. I'm going to link the video that Dr. Morse made yesterday. He made it as soon as the news broke out. He made, he was like fucking at the gym. He was like, I'm going to do a live stream right now about Alvin Kamara's health. Um, so he went more in depth. Obviously, I can't break it down like a doctor because, again, only technically a doctor. I can't. I, I don't know the words that they use. So I'll link that down below. I, w- I would very much suggest you just go watch that. It's like five minutes long um, and it's very helpful and it's very telling. So that being said, Kamara, yeah, is definitely not a top five pick for me. Uh, you'll have to see in my draft guide on BigDogsDraftGuide.com just how far he falls into my rankings. So we're into the fourth round, and this is, again, the sweet spot for the running backs. You have Mark Cooper, Robinson, A.J. Brown, Odell round out the third round. And then you have a bunch of wide receivers, and I'm up on the clock. Please tell me Terry didn't go. Ah, oh, you stupid motherfucker. Jake Plummer, you dumb. You know what? You know what? I'm going to keep it kid-friendly. I'm not going to curse. I'm not going to yell. Uh, he took, he took Terry from me and now I'm sitting here looking at what wide receivers are left on the board. Uh, a lot of good ones still. I will go with Calvin Ridley because he, I've seen for some reason, for one reason or another, Ridley started the summer going in like the early fourth round. And I've been getting him more and more in like the four, nine to five, one range. And there after these guys, like I would take Terry over him. I would take Lockett over him. I would take DJ Chark over him. I would take Robert Woods over him. All these fourth round guys, I would take over Ridley, but I'm not like against Ridley, if that makes sense. So if he's a guy that falls to me in value, sure, I will be in on Ridley. Zach Ertz is another interesting kind of case study because he just seemed to slip further and further and further throughout drafts. And now we're getting that little roller coaster ride of his value and his ADP, given Jalen Rager is going to be out for a month. We don't know what Alshon Jeffrey's status is, if he's going to start on the pup. And if so, like we talked about how Zach Ertz was kind of non-existent over the first half of last year. And then once everybody got hurt, he became like the focal point of that passing game. And it seems like we're going to go into the year where a lot of the injuries on the Eagles offense happen again, and he might be the focal point of this offense again. So Ertz in the fourth round, I'm probably still not really as bullish on him in the fourth round. I would probably still take Waller two rounds later or just uh, double stack a Jared Cook and TJ Hawkinson later in the draft, which is what we'll probably end up doing. But this this area of the draft just seems too beautiful to pass up on the wide receivers because we're three picks away and I can get my choice of Metcalf, Sutton, or Marquise Brown pretty much with this draft pick. I hope Metcalf falls to me, but I don't think he's going to. And I've got people asking me, would you stack Metcalf and Tyler Lockett on the same team? My answer to that, and if you guys listen to me, I've talked about stacking and what my my thesis, my overall, oh, hell yeah, so Metcalf fell to me, cool. And I'm, I'm hoping that Russell Wilson falls to me so I could stack Metcalf and Wilson. Um, my, my general rule of stacking is this. If it's a very, very good offense, I'm okay with stacking players. If it's a bad offense, I'm completely off the board with it. Like I'm not taking Le'Veon Bell in the fifth round and then Jamison Crowder in the eighth round. I'm not taking, you know, even even like I'm definitely not taking like Kendra, Kenyon Dehop in the second, Kenyon Drake in the third or vice versa, flip it, whatever it is. Because there's a very good chance that whatever offense you're double stacking in can be bad, right? If it's a bad offense, you don't want to put a heavy investment into those players on that offense because it can go very bad very quickly. If you're in a very good offense, 
uh, then yeah, I'm c- completely fine with it. Cause listen, one dictates the other. If you're stacking up a running back and a wide receiver also fine with it. Cause guess what? If a wide receiver has a good game, that doesn't mean that the running back can't, that also means the wide receiver is having a good game because he's accumulating a lot of yards. He's making a lot of catches. He's moving the chains, which means more opportunities for the running back guys. Like you use your brain a little bit here. So the locket Metcalf debate. I am team Lockett over Metcalf. I do understand the upside that Metcalf has as a pure talent and a pure player. Uh, those two are going to be like the target funnel here. They don't really have a pass catching running back. They bring in all these old tight ends, uh, Greg Olson. They have Will Disley coming back from his second serious injury in as many years, and they don't have a real number three. I do like the addition of Paul Richardson. That's that's interesting. Leonard Fournette to five. That is fucking unforgivable right there. Um, so yeah, I think this is. I mean, this is one of the most pure fucking passing offenses in terms of Russell Wilson. Hopefully they let this man throw the fucking ball. But regardless, he's finished the last three seasons in a row with 30 or more touchdowns. And again, I think like between Lockett and Metcalf, both of them will break a thousand yards. They will see a combined like 48 to 50% target share. And when you're getting that percentage of targets from fucking Russell Wilson, like, yes, sign me the fuck up. So I'm all in on a Metcalf, Lockett, Wilson stack. If, if there's any if there's any year to just say fuck it and do some weird shit, it is absolutely 2020. Leonard Fournette, uh, I can't, no, just fucking absolutely. He doesn't even have a team right now, okay? Best, I, in my opinion, absolute best case scenario is Fournette lands with New England. He lands with the Patriots. And from the reports, they were like top three in terms of like betting odds on favorite to land Fournette, but they're all coming out and saying that they don't think that they're actually going to make a run at Fournette. If he doesn't land there, like it's it's even if he landed there, the only thing that was enticing was the fact that he would get a lot of goal line work, probably, right? He would get a lot of goal line work, but he wasn't catching passes. They already have specialty players to catch passes with James White and Rex Burkett. No matter where Fournette goes, he's not guaranteed the number of carries that he was in Jacksonville, and he's not guaranteed any sort of pass catching work relative to what he got in Jacksonville. So uh, anywhere Fournette, Fournette, uh, you can go check my rankings. I'm pretty sure I moved Leonard Fournette down to like 115th overall. That's just my way of saying there is no shot. I am taking a top five round pick on him. It's just absolutely asinine. So if any of you guys are drafting today, tonight, tomorrow, and we don't even have a fucking team for Leonard Fournette yet. So yeah, just, 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 just don't, just don't do that. He's like, he's a double digit round pick for me uh, at like the earliest. And even then I'm going to hesitate taking the, the pick with him. Please, Tyler Boyd, fall to me. Do it, do it, do it. Tyler Boyd. Jake Plummer, if you snipe me again, I'm going to throw a football at my fucking laptop and break it. You're fucking lucky, Plummer. I don't have, I don't know where my football is. I don't know. Oh, I'm upset. I'm really upset. Someone's going to have to make a compilation of all the times I've been fucking sniped or timed out on. Uh, so we're sitting here and I'm just, I'm just not going to think too hard about this. Ooh, do I want Waller or Wilson? Do I, want, I said I'm not going to think too hard about it, and then I think too fucking hard about it. Give me Russell Wilson. Give me Russell Wilson. Now I get that stack. I love – anytime you can stack in best ball, uh, things are going to be pretty for your team. It, it gives you a slight percentage upgrade, and I'm not someone who does, like, the analytics and the math and the fucking Excel charts when it comes to best ball stuff, but there are a lot of people working on good best ball data and analytics and stacking is definitely a bump up in your percentage chance of winning. And now I've stacked, interestingly enough, I've stacked Russell Wilson, Chris Carson, and DK Metcalf. I didn't even realize that, but again, they're, they're an offense that I'm comfortable with in stacking. You're shooting for upside here. You have to beat 11 other teams. And I think the upside of what Seattle's offense could be if they let Russ throw a little bit more is non-existent to the naked eye. So I'm, I'm liking how this team turns out really, 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 really like it right now. We have Russ, as the quarterback, we have Henry and Carson as my running backs, and we have Godwin, Calvin Ridley, DK Metcalf as a wide receiver. Just really solid all around. I'm hoping uh, Darren Waller falls to me as my tight end one. That would be fucking beautiful right now. J.K. Dobbins moving up boards quickly. He has approached the sixth round ADP because Harbaugh came out yesterday and said he's going to have a significant role. I still think Mark Ingram's going to be too involved and too annoying and too much on the goal line, and they don't pass the ball to their running backs enough to really see J.K. Dobbins be a fantasy factor. Sixth round, completely off my board. Seventh round, I might start thinking about it, but even then, I'm probably not. All right, so this is beautiful. This guy already has a tight end, so there's almost no chance he's taking Darren Waller here. Hey, there we go. I love this team. I love this team. This might be the best draft I've ever actually 
put on paper. A lot of you guys will be like, I hate your team. Listen, when I do these mock draft videos, I'm focusing on like 10 different things. I'm making sure my screen looks all right. I got the fucking social media thing above me, always going nuts, and I have to move it back and forth. I have to focus on drafting and not timing out. I got to focus on giving you guys good player analysis, and that is the most important part of this video making sure that you guys are hearing what I'm saying. So don't worry about my team, right? I, 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 I pick under panic. I pick under pressure, and I panic when I pick under pressure. I need to get a, uh, a windscreen for this fucking mic because you guys probably hear that. It's like the crazy dude from Little Nicky. You know that? They try to get his fucking flask back. And that goes, he'd be, a, he'd be a phenomenal podcaster as long as you put a windscreen up on him. Okay. Bike to what I was saying. Um, I don't know what I was saying. Uh, with quarterbacks, I, I've I've made this point many times. I think the quarterback position is going to be a very pivotal piece of success in, in 2020 fantasy football leagues where I wouldn't normally say that. In both one quarterback and super flex leagues, in one quarterback specifically, there's a huge gap between Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, and then where the rest of the elite guys are. Now, typically we have the, the upper tier, and then we drop off to the Matt Ryans and the Josh Allens who are like the tier two. So just because there's like two tiers, we kind of have it in our head that they're the same, like they're the same price. But this year we have, we really have two number one tiers, and then we get into that range of Matt Ryan, Josh Allen. We have Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes all the way up front, and then we have the Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, Dak Prescott, Kyler Murray, and those are like the second tier of the number one tiers. So if those guys drop into the sixth, seventh round, I'm more than happy you know, using one of the mid-round picks on a quarterback like that who's going to solidify that spot for you, and uh, especially when you have a stack. That stack is fucking precious. Um, but more so in best ball, if you do sign up on Underdog Fantasy, Make sure you do. Make sure you download the app. They got Google Store, iOS Store. I will link all that stuff down below in the comments and the description of the video. If you do, the thing about quarterback is there's no there's no trades. There's no waiver wire in these best ball leagues, okay? So they take the best part about fantasy football, which is, are the drafts, right? You have the most fun drafting. And if you join 50 leagues, it's impossible to keep up with them. So for this, you don't actually have to keep up with the leagues. You don't have to keep up with the team. You just draft, come back in January, collect your monies. That being said, the idea of this whole late round quarterback thing doesn't work as well in here because you can't just throw out a guy and pick someone up off the waivers if he's not producing. Because again, they don't have waiver wires in here. So I am more than okay using an earlier pick on quarterbacks because if someone busts, you don't have the luxury of hitting that waiver wire. And I got my boy Darren Waller. Uh, Y'all have heard me talk about him more than enough. So I will shut my mouth about that. What else do we got? So we've got this interesting range of wide receivers in the seventh round after I picked Waller, Christian Kirk, a little bit too early for me. Julian Edelman, I like that pick a lot. Brandon Cooks, I'm really warming up to the fact that Brandon Cooks might be, I, I here's the thing, like DeAndre Hopkins was the high target guy there in Houston. We thought of it. We thought of him as like a you know a downfield playmaker, a guy who's like really strong with the hands. But he was catching like eight to ten passes a game. That's not the type of player Will Fuller is. He's not going to be the guy running the comebacks. He's not going to be the guy running all the slants. Like he's a deep threat on the team. And those targets that were five yards, seven yards, ten yards down the line of scrimmage down the field, I don't think are going to go to Will Fuller. I could see Will Fuller still being a six to seven target guy a game. It's not going to surprise me if we see come out in week one Brandon Cooks catching eight to nine passes like. I could 100% see a stat line of like eight for 111 and a touchdown in week one from Brandon Cooks. And then immediately we're all going to be like, fuck, I wish I took more Brandon Cooks and not as much Will Fuller. I, I, I'm, I'm really, really warming up to the fact that I like Cooks, especially for the fact that you can get him. Cooks went at the 7-7. Let me make sure I got a couple guys in the queue. Uh, oh, I love me some Deshaun Jackson. I love Deshaun Jackson here. Where is it? Yeah, he's creeping up the ADPs quickly. Sean Jackson is interesting. Is there anyone else I really like here? Nah, running back, no. Not too much value here. Yeah, so we're just going to run with Deshaun Jackson here. Um, I think he's pretty much a must-draft player at this point because of Jalen Rager's injury. Uh, and what was I saying right before that? I lose my train of thought about 42 times throughout this segment. Oh, Brandon Cooks. Yeah, so Brandon Cooks went off at the 7-7. Will Fuller went off the board at the – Jesus Christ – at the five, three. So a two and a half round discount. And I will say, I will preface with this, where if you are practicing on underdog, you get like really, th these drafts are extremely sharp because all the people on underdog are pretty much 
in my audience, they're from Establish the Run. They're from Matt Kelly's player, uh, you know, Roto Underworld podcast. Like they're all audiences that are really, really invested into fantasy. So these are the sharpest drafts and they're the ones I think get you the most prepared. But that being said, if you look at some of the draft picks here, they're going to go earlier than they would in your home and friends league. So Brandon Cooks will not be a seventh round pick probably in your friends league, but I think he's a phenomenal eighth, ninth, 10th round pick. I really think he's someone who's going to get a high volume in this Houston offense. And Deshaun Watson is going to have to throw the ball to somebody. And I think that somebody becomes uh, Brandon Cooks. I mean, it's going to be Will Fuller, of course, too. But I think Brandon Cooks is going to be someone who is like a PPR stud this year. We've seen him. I mean, we've seen him post like four or five consecutive thousand yard seasons before the age of 26. Like he's been here before. Last year was just a fucked up season uh, with injuries and everything. He just did not fit into that game plan of that offense. What happened was like Brandon Cooks, here's the thing, like he was the odd man out of those receivers. Um, when the Rams offensive line kind of crashed and deteriorated, it deteriorated, we can go over to, yeah, we can go over to any website with advanced analytics and I'll tell you that the Rams offensive line was absolute trash, okay? And when that happens, you have to put an extra lineman or an extra person body up there to block. And that body needs to come in the form of a tight end which means they are running two tight end sets. They want Tyler Higby running the routes. They want whoever the secondary guy is to block. So that means two wide receivers are on the field, not three wide receivers. And Brandon Cooks dealing with the injuries and dealing with whatever he dealt with last year was the odd man out. And I think that could probably account for why his numbers were so down. I mean, we know he, he didn't just become bad all of a sudden, right? We have like five a five-year sample size of him being really, really, really good, changing teams, switching quarterbacks, switching locations. So... We talk about this a lot. Like, we don't want the guy who switches teams in his first year. I would say that's more of a problem when you're looking at uh, someone who's getting dra drafted really, really early. Like, DeAndre Hopkins, I'm not taking him in the second round. I've seen him even go in, like, the 112 before, which is just asinine. But first round, second round, I'm off DeAndre Hopkins. I don't like the switching of teams. But Brandon Cook's an eighth, ninth, tenth round guy. And we already have a sample size of him switching teams and being really successful going to LA going to New England going to New York like he's been really really good anywhere that he's landed in in the first year so I'm not worried about the move for him he's adjusted to it he knows how to get this thing going so we will be entering the 10th round soon seeing some rookies go off the board uh Tariq Cohen so what happens with David Montgomery is pretty much off my board, to be honest with you, uh, depending on where you have to take him. Let's see where he went in this draft. I think he'll likely go in like the sixth, seventh round of most drafts. Uh, some people will probably try to get too cute. Yeah, so the 6'5", I'm good. I don't know what the reports really are on Montgomery, to be honest, but I'm nervous about the groin. I'm nervous that that's going to be something that lingers through the like the entire first month of the season. And by then, I mean, I, I I don't know. This team is just not in a good situation. So Montgomery was a fine floor play when you knew he was going to play 16 games. And now you know he's going to play, you know, probably 15, maybe 14, maybe 13, maybe 15, but two or three of them are hampered. Like, I, I just don't see the value in a floor play uh, that early. And, like, when he comes back, you know, who knows? Maybe Cordell Patterson was their running back and carved out a little bit of a, a role in the backfield. Like, do they really want DeMont taking 20 carries a game? I don't know. I think there are some red flags here. So for the most part, Montgomery's kind of off my board. And now he's got going, like I've said this a million times, you're going into the year injured, right? So the chances of you pushing yourself to get back onto the field too early are great, which means your re-injury risk is great. I'm not saying he's an injury-prone player, but if you're going into the year at less than 100%, your chances of being re-injured are much higher than everyone else's. So that means his ceiling was never really that high. This means like his injury floor, now that he really has one, a real one, is also low. So you're taking a, you know, a low ceiling or a medium ceiling, like low floor guy in the fifth, sixth round. And I'm kind of completely off on that. So you'll have to, you'll have to follow reports really closely over the weekend and see if, you know, if he's getting any run on the field, but like, I, I don't know, it, it's a, it's a situation that makes me completely nervous and I kind of want to be off of him. All right. So we took Matt Breida with the last pick. Uh, I, I love Matt Breida. I think he's going to have a 50, 50 split with Jordan Howard, I don't think this offense is going to be very good. So give me the guy who is not depending on goal line work, is not going to depend on uh, in between the 20s carries behind a really poor offensive line. Yes, I know they're improved, but they're not going to be an above average offensive line. So give me the guy who is more explosive, who can give you all the fantasy points you need on a single play, who is going to catch the majority of passes. So give me Matt Breed over Jordan Howard 52 days a week. What do we have here in uh, I love me some Jared Cook. Fuck, I don't think I should do that, though. Uh, we timed out. God damn it. Who'd we take? All right. Uh, not what I wanted to do, but 
my dumb ass never puts anybody in the queue. Ah, shit. What are we doing? We're fucking falling apart right in front of my audience's eyes. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for this fucking putrid performance. Um, all right. On the real, though, we're like halfway through the draft. We're a little bit more than halfway through the draft. If you are enjoying the video thus far, uh, do me a favor. Just scroll down a little bit and hit the thumbs up button. Nope. You're not allowed to call me, sir. Uh, hit the thumbs up button. Looks like this. If you've ever been like, yay, cool, this is really fun, someone will do this to you. That's the button I want y'all to hit right now. So scroll down. It takes two seconds. Let's me know you appreciate this kind of content. Let's me know that you're getting some informational value from it. Okay. Um, yeah, and you can subscribe down there if you are new to the channel as well. We'll be putting out a whole lot of fantasy stuff throughout the off season. I mean, in season. Ah, Boston Scott, good freaking pick there, bruh. Good pick, sir. Good pick. Ooh, running backs are ugly. This is why you want to get the running backs early and often because you get down here and all the guys that were fun to draft a few months ago, even in the 11th round, Duke Johnson, Darrell Henderson, Keyshawn Vaughn, Sonny Michelle, A.J. Dillon. Oh, God, it is a fucking Lee. So I'm probably going to keep smashing. Uh, see, like this is why I can't believe they took Stafford over Tom Brady for me. That's such an L on my part. I could have stacked Brady with Godwin there and Smiles couldn't have sniped me. Uh, so the best player available to me on the board right now is without a question, Jared Cook. I'm either going to look really smart or really, really dumb at the end of the season going all in on Jared Cook and Darren Waller. These are by far and away my two fucking mother fudgers. They're on the same bye week. They're on the same bye. I'm never going to learn. I've been doing these drafts for three fucking years. And all I do is pick players on the same bye week. I wish there was like, uh, I wish these were live streamed so that like you could, um, I wish these were in person so you could shoot me when I fucking pick players on the same buy. I love Jared Cook, though. It might be worth it. Now I'm going to have to... I guess it's not that bad because I don't have to double down on quarterbacks because they're very strong. Thankfully, I have Russ to anchor that. I'm not going to pick a third quarterback. I'm going to have to go with the third tight end, obviously, because those guys are on the same bye week. Jared Cook, man, I've gone over this a million times. He came into the year a little bit banged up, then Drew, and also in a brand new offense. Drew Brees got banged up, missed a bunch of games. By the time them two came back, Jared Cook had double digit fantasy points in nine of the final 10 games. Okay. Like I don't, I haven't checked the numbers, but I don't think any other fantasy tight end did that over the last 10 games of the season. There's no way they did. And those weren't just like only 10, 11 point games. He was going for 18, 19, 21 point games. And those are half PPR numbers. This dude downfield playmaker going to be involved in the offense. Like I love Jared cook this year as someone you can get in the 11th, 11th freaking round. You fucking kidding me. You freaking, you freaking, I have such a cursing problem. I try to say freaking to stop do saying fucking, and then I end the sentence with a fuck word. <sighs> I should go to a therapist probably. I was thinking about that. Like, You guys go to th therapy? Like, You guys have a, uh, a therapist that you go to? I feel like it's not ostracized anymore, so like a lot more people are opening up to it, which is good because we have such a mental health fucking crisis in our country right now. So many people are insecure. And I mean, I, I honestly, I blame advertising. I love marketing. I love doing it, but I like doing it the right way. I don't like selling you that you're not good enough, right? That's what advertising really is. When it comes down to it, advertising is all material. Advertising is selling you that you're not pretty enough or good looking enough or fast enough or can jump high enough. Thus, you need to buy our fucking product, right? It's all that kind of shit. And that makes people insecure on the daily. And it's fucking with everybody's heads. They feel like they can't be themselves at all times. I, f I mean, listen, this ain't, this ain't me crying out for help. I promise. Like, I feel good about myself. I'm very, I'm very myself on these videos and I'm with you guys, but I still would go to the therapist. Be nice to just have a completely unbiased person in my life that I could just talk shit to be like, you know, my, one of my fucking friends did this the other day. He's a piece of shit, but I would never tell him that, you know, it'd be, it'd be fun to do it. However, however, when you're running a business, you got to cut expenses. And I'll tell you what, my health insurance is fucking abysmal it's literally called the catastrophic health insurance plan it's literally what it's called the catastrophic you know they have like elite gold silver i think some of them have bronze and then every once in a while you get a really shitty company that has a catastrophic plan that's the one i'm on otherwise you got to pay like 600 dollars a month and i'm like listen bitch i got other needs i got to put this into software i got to pay for margaritas i got to pay for microphones and fucking video cameras i'm not paying for health insurance that i'm not going to use i'm a young healthy spry you whippersnapper and i'm not getting sick and COVID's free anyways, if I do get sick. It's a huge fucking lie. COVID's not free to treat, just free to get tested for.
So I'm going to do, and I'm, man, I'm really reckless. I wasn't, I was barely careful throughout this entire quarantine, but I got tested and I'm, I was negative for everything. So I don't think I ever had it. Um, but yeah, so, uh, insurance won't cover any therapy for me. Sorry, that was a ridiculous entire segment that I just did. Um, okay, so now we're bike on the clock at the end of the 12th round. We have a few guys we are looking at. I'm going to go with Curtis Samuel on here. I really like Mr. Michael Pittman. Brian Edwards makes a little bit of sense. I still think the, the hype on him is, is like a little bit unwarranted. I know that what's-his-face just got hurt. Uh, Tyrell Williams is going to be out for the entirety of the year. Is there anyone down here that we like? I, I I tell you what, like he's boring. I'm gonna go with Adrian Peterson here. We gotta put Darrell Williams in the queue because he has pretty much been announced the unquestioned number two in this offense. Um, so let's go down these this, this list right here. So I was like the 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 poster boy for anti Curtis Samuel bullshit. Everyone just kept saying the word unrealized air yards in the beginning of the summer, and uh, I'm like, okay, listen. I get that a lot of his passes were inaccurate, but like he did, he almost, he did like almost nothing. Um, he did almost nothing last year. Like he could have done something with the targets he got, but he's still like such an explosive playmaker. And I'm really on board with the Teddy Bridgewater coming over and Joe Brady from LSU that I think they're going to use him the correct way. And he's finally going to get accurate passes. So I'm not completely off Curtis Samuel like I used to be. But I do think he's like the third, fourth, maybe even a fifth option in this passing game. Like you just saw Robbie Anderson go off the board before him. I would take Curtis over Robbie Anderson. I think Robbie Anderson is going to have like one good week every three or four weeks. And I'm I'm like, that's going to give me a headache. There's no way I'm going to try to decide when to take him. Oh, great pick on fucking Chris Thompson. That's who I should have taken. Damn it. What happens is like the ADPs obviously don't react until a bunch of drafts are done. So Chris Thompson's probably ADP is still down in like 190 fucking two. Uh, So yeah. From the Leonard Fournette situation, the only back I really want there is Chris Thompson. Maybe a last round flyer on Divino Zigbo. But if uh, Rykel Armstead starts going in like the single digit rounds, there's no chance I'm taking him. So Curtis Samuel, yeah, like if he can get a few more accurate passes, I'm on board with that. Uh, I took Adrian Peterson because I'm pretty sure he's just going to end up with 200 carries. I think he's going to be the early down grinder. Like I don't care about all these reports of, you know, Antonio Gibson running with the ones. Let's say AP's not there practicing. Like if AP's there, he's running with the ones, and Antonio Gibson is a gadget player. Maybe he gets targets, maybe he doesn't. Yada yada. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go with Curtis Samuel. I don't have a lot of shares of him, but I do like the system that they're in now, and I do think there is legitimate. Uh, upside with him the upside that everyone wanted from him last year like it was just impossible with Kyle Allen and what's his face throwing him the ball um so now with a more accurate quarterback supposedly Teddy's been lights out of practice this summer the more accurate quarterback a good offensive system I'm, I'm kind of excited to see what goes on there in Carolina this is not it's not to the detriment of DJ Moore he's still going to be uh an incredible player for the Panthers c Mac's going to get his hundred that's that's the, that's the thing that makes it difficult like after c Mac and DJ Moore you know are we just going to see Curtis Samuel have one good game? Then Robbie Anderson have one good game. Ian Thomas have one good game. Like, it gets a little messy there. But I do think overall, you just want pieces of offenses that are going to score a lot. And I think Carolina is in line, you know, in theory on paper, should be a team that scores a lot. So I like Curtis Samuel. Um, I took Adrian Peterson. I put Darrell Williams on here because, again, they said that, you know, DeAndre Washington was a guy I was heavily investing in in like the 13th, 14th round because I thought he would be the clear number two. And I think whoever the number two is to Clyde Edwards Hilaire is going to get uh, a pretty decent amount of work. Like he's someone who only needs to get five to eight touches a game, not Clyde, the whoever's backup is. And like, if he could score a touchdown, like you can get five to eight touches a game in that Kansas city offense and finish with 13 or 14 points. Like we see it. We've, we've seen it all the time. We've seen it. We see We saw it so many times with LaShawn McCoy and Damian Williams and whoever was in the back. Darrell Williams had a couple big games last year, just being a role player, a backup guy, just the running back situation in Kansas city is just so beautiful. So damn beautiful. And I've mentioned this stat a, a ton of times too. But since Patrick Mahomes has taken over as a starting quarterback in games where he's a starter, the Kansas City running backs have averaged 1.74 touchdowns per game. That's an insane number. That is insane. And that does include the playoffs. But regardless, that's like a two-year sample size of starts with Patrick Mahomes. So, like, even if Clyde scores a touchdown a game, you know, six, you're not going to project him for 16 touchdowns. But if he scores 12 or 13, there's probably still like eight or nine left over for other running backs. And if Darrell's the number two, like that's a phenomenal pick all the way down here. So people drafting DeAndre Washington 
earlier on, like myself, my dumbass, um, got fooled a little bit. Probably should have waited. And now I'm taking Darrell Williams. But also by like week four, it could be DeAndre Washington. So I'm just spewing out a bunch of fucking bullshit. Oh, we had Hunter Renfro. Also, what's cool about Underdog, I don't know if you uh, if you guys have the app. If you don't already fucking have the app, just do it on your phone. Stop watching me on the phone. Watch me on the laptop, the big fucking screen. I deserve to be in a movie theater. Go to the app, download it, and you could see your most owned players. So you go to drafts on the bottom and then complete it on the top and the ownership percentage. This is, this is fucked up. Hunter Renfro is my single highest owned player in underdog i own him in 45 percent of drafts and i also own Derek carr in 21 percent. he's my second highest owned quarterback running backs i have austin eckler zach moss anthony mcfarland josh jacobs james white ronald jones wide receivers we have hunter renfro sean jackson let's fucking go adam thielen michael pittman alan lazard alan robinson i like a lot of allens there a lot of allens it's a weird fucking name to like dk metcalf Devontae Parker, Tyler Boyd, DJ Chark, Scotty Miller, top 10. Um, yeah, so you can see the ownership percentages on the app, which is really cool. And the app is super, super duper clean. And I'll take Darrell Williams here, baby. That is a that is an ugly looking running back core. As soon as I said I liked my team, it all went fucking downhill after that. I hate you guys. I do like my my wide receivers are absolute filth, though. Sean Jackson is going to come out and he, he can get hurt in the fifth snap. By the fifth snap, he's probably got 22 fantasy points. If we're being honest here. Uh, so unfortunately, Justin Jackson was also a guy I was taking a lot of, but he has been missing practice and the buzz on Josh Kelly is growing louder and louder. It's like a fucking Hornets buzz at this point. And uh, supposedly he is the favorite to take over the one a or the one B to Eckler's one a get a lot of goal line work. So I am, I am having to pivot from Justin Jackson over to Joshua Kelly. Unfortunately, uh, you hate to see it. You hate to just get fucking buried like that. I'm going to need a third tight end. Uh, they're going off the board quickly, huh? Not a lot of good options. I think Irv Smith as a third tight end is probably the best pick available right now. He's not someone that I'm targeting in season-long leagues, but I guess if you do go with one tight end in like the 10th or 11th round, you need a high upside bench guy. I don't hate Irv Smith. Um, he did start getting as many snaps and running as many routes as Kyle Rudolph did over the second half of last year, which makes you think that he will be that involved, if not more so, going forward. Um, so Irv Smith will have his days, but it's hard to rely. Like, you don't want a tight end in a committee. Like, T-E-B-B-C. Tight end tight end back by committee. Tight ends are bike, baby. We're going to go with Irv Smith in the 15th round. That's just an egregious pick. I'm so sorry. Whew, you know, it's so funny. Like, I, I sweat so much during making these videos, and my shorts just stick to my seat. You probably actually already... Well, I don't know if Noah put this in the outtakes or not, but my whole ass sticks to it. You just hate to hear that. You just really hate to hear it. Imagine I was just butt naked and I was like, my ass sticks to the seat and I just came up and my ass cheeks were there. What would y'all do? I feel like it would be my most liked video of all time. Not that any of you guys are probably still even listening at this point, but... I wonder if I just cut these off at like the 13th round, if like anyone would even be like... Dude, you stopped the 13th round. What the fuck? Like, my bad. I didn't realize you were still watching. Okay, so um, I'm probably going to grab Jow. No, I'm not because Tool Man, you're a fucking tool. You're really living up to that name. Took Joshua Kelly from me. Um, I was going to grab a six running back, which a lot of times I end up with five running backs on the squad uh, because I hammer them early and I have a lot of good options up front. But here, obviously, running backs are a little bit weaker than wide receivers. So I might go with a six and seven stack. Two quarterbacks, six running backs, seven wide receivers, and we'll have three tight ends. But it appears that anyone who's even remotely okay is getting fucking plucked. He's getting plurked. Oh, my man's Divino Zigbo. I see you, dog. I see you down there. Frank Gore starting over Le'Veon Bell. You'll love to hear it. Just kidding. He's not actually fucking starting over Le'Veon Bell. Relax. Tom Montgomery's a really interesting stash in Dynasty Leagues because everyone assumes... Now, while obviously Latavius Murray becomes a really interesting pick now that Kamara has these concerns, everyone assumes that Latavius is going to take over that role that he had last year as like the top five running back in fantasy. I think this becomes a committee if Kamara misses games. I think Ty Montgomery's skill set is way more indicative of the Alvin Kamara type. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if Ty Montgomery saw like five to six targets a game along with five to seven carries. And that obviously makes Latavius a lot less valuable. So Montgomery is a, a, a guy that if he's on your dynasty wire, I would absolutely go and pick up right now. Same thing with Divino Zigbo. I don't hate J.D. McKissick either as a last round pick. I think I think he's going to have the role as the pass catcher there out of the backfield. Like Antonio Gibson is going to be a weapon. I think uh, I saw a report that like if the Redskins keep three running backs, it's going to be Peterson, Gibson and J.D. McKissick. And I think like I could totally see him having that pass catching role in this backfield. Let's see what we got here. Oh, James Washington all the way in the 17th. Huh? 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 Throw him on there. I'm, I'm like, I'm just not. I just don't understand the Stephen Sims hype. Maybe I'll look like an idiot, but uh, look at Kendrick Bourne because the entire San Francisco group is completely banged up and they have no one to throw to. And also, uh, Brett Coleman, my boy. I don't know if you guys have ever watched his videos, but he DM'd me and was like, "Grab Kendrick Bourne. He's going to be a stud for like the first three weeks while Ayuk and Debo are getting back to their their self." So I've been taking a little bit of Kendrick Bourne in like the seventh, eighth round, seventeenth, eighteenth round. Who else down here is interesting? Chase Claypool becomes a little bit interesting because I could see him, you know, catching six to seven touchdowns this year just on like back shoulder fades. And Isabella should not be going this late. Neither should Scotty. Like I said, Scotty Miller. Where did he go? Did you just get sniped? Did I just get sniped on Scotty? No, I didn't. So these are the wide receivers I think I like left on the board. Uh, Andy Isabella apparently is for sure starting in the slot this year, which is fantastic news. Because he like was not ready to do so last year. He's an extremely explosive player and like a really exciting player, but they just never got him on the field. And you know, Cliff Kingsbury's offenses typically run four wide receivers. So get this kid on the field and he's gonna make a lot of plays. I don't know if uh, how familiar you guys are with uh, Andy Isabella player profiler. Where are you? I mean, let's go. Like 4 3 1, 40 yard dash. Best comparable to Tyler Lockett. Absolutely dominant in college, obviously, at UMass. But we saw him play against legit competitors in college, and he blew up some SEC teams. He just never got the chance last year. Um, when he did, he made some explosive plays. So I'm excited to see what Isabella can actually do while on the field. I think that JGR Sega Whiteside pick is pretty, pretty sharp because of all the injuries. I think Jaws and Deshaun Jackson will be the starters in Philly for the first week, two weeks, three weeks, as Jalen Rager gets back to speed. And the reports out of camp, I mean, they were good last year on Jaws. Everyone's like, oh, it looks so fucking good. And then he turned out to be absolute fucking trash. Also could happen. They have been saying he looks like, he looks like a different player. And if he's going to be one of the main targets on this Philly offense, like, I'm here for it, even though I think Greg Ward's probably better. So we're rounding down our last two picks. I'll grab Ozigbo here if he falls to me. Otherwise, there's no other running backs that I, like, have any confidence in being fantasy guys i don't hate the, the Fitzgerald pick here either i think like 17th round is perfect he's gonna he's gonna get 700 receiving yards catch 60 passes four touchdown five touchdowns so he'll have his weeks where he gets into your lineup again you start three wide receivers so you start more wide receivers than you do running backs and there's also a flex play here they don't list it here but they do have a flex spot when you play the actual season out all right no smiles don't make this difficult on me Hey, there you go. So we're going to take Divine. Um, where I call Armstead has missed the majority of the offseason with COVID IR and then another illness. And Divine has taken a lot of the first team snaps. Same thing with James Robinson, the player that I'm probably going to have to look into a little bit more. But I really like Divine coming out of college. He was a, a hard runner who had a really, really productive final year. Um, but he just couldn't stick onto the Saints roster. And now he's in a, in a place where he can get real opportunity here. So we have one more pick to make, and it'll be one of these three wide receivers as long as they get bike to me. I guess we'll just throw Sims on there just because we need another player. This is typically where I'd smash some fucking Derek Carr if I didn't have Russ and Stafford there. I really wish I took Brady, man. The Russ Brady stack with Metcalf and Chris Godwin would have been beautiful. Would have been the most beautiful thing I've seen since I was born. What do we got? I, you know what I do on underdog? I just start like 13 slow drafts. Like there's there's two types of drafts on underdog. You could do a fast draft like this where it's 30 seconds per pick, which I suggest if you're uh, preparing for your league and you need to do a draft. Like obviously you could do this in 45 minutes or an hour, 
But there's also slow drafts where it's four hours per pick. So you could join like 19 of them. And then like every 10, 15 minutes, you got a new pick. So you're diversifying the revenue. You're also seeing a bunch of different samples of drafts where other guys might go, moving up and down the board, et cetera, et cetera. So I always have a bunch of drafts going on. And I'm on the I'm on the clock at the 9-5. I have Lamar Jackson. I, I did a Lamar Jackson, Marquise Brown stack. Oh, uh, this is ugly. I took Alvin Kamara at the five, and this is a slow draft, so it probably was like four or five days ago. You hate to see it. Eh, maybe, maybe I'm just completely fucking wrong on Kamara. Who knows? Ooh, there's nothing left on the board that I like here. This is disgusting. Who am I going to take? Who should I take? The 9-5. We're not taking a quarterback because I have Lamar. Tony Pollard, Tariq Cohen. I guess like Tariq Cohen's not the worst pick now that David Montgomery is banged up. But I, I just think he's just not good. I just think he's just not good at all. Sorry, I got to shoot this text out right quick. Oh, my God. My sister just sent me this picture of this little pug. We had a pug. I had a pug for like 15 years. His name was Skippy. Named him after the peanut butter. So he got so fat by like... He lived, he lived to be 15, which is ridiculous for a pug. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever owned a pug. I want to get a dog so bad right now. Like, I want a fat dog, a bulldog, or a pug so bad. But, like, I could barely take care of myself. So, I don't feel like I'm responsible enough to have a dog. So, like, in theory, it sounds cool. And when I like, put it out on Twitter, everyone's like, yeah, just get a dog, bro. And I'm like, fuck you. Like, I'm the one that has to take care of it. <sighs> like, I ask for their opinion, and then they give it to me, and then I tell them to fuck off. I'm such a, a bad person. Uh, anyways, yeah, we had a pug for like 15 years, and if you have a pug, by they start losing their senses. They go, they go like full Helen Keller on us. My dog, for the last five years we had him, had zero eyesight and zero hearing. Like when I'm not even like, this is not hyperbolic. This is not me trying to be funny. Couldn't hear or see a single thing. Like you could be standing right in front of him, clapping and screaming his name. Zero emotion would come out of his soul. Which I, and I feel bad, but like after a while, it became a little bit funny to me. Um, and we couldn't move any furniture around in our house because he would run. He like he he knew the house for like five years. He was blind, but he knew the arrangement of the house, so he would be able to walk through like a path because he knew it. We're gonna take Kendrick Bourne here. If I took Tom Brady, I would take Scott Miller here to have that stack, but I'll take Bourne here. Um, but he'd run into shit every once in a while, and it was actually low key funny. Sometimes, like he would know he would want someone to open the uh, open a door for him so he would stand right next to the door he would stand in, like the corner of the door and sometimes he would just be in the corner of a room thinking that it was a door and he would just like stand there with the f in the fucking corner with his face right into it it was hilarious i have some pictures of it that i'm not going to end up editing this video so i'm not going to show you so i don't know why i'm telling you the story case in point i fucking love pugs and i miss skippy a lot and uh, i would talk to it I would talk to my therapist about it if I was not on a catastrophic health insurance plan. Okay, that's how we're going to wrap up the video. I don't think I could have ended these weekly mock drafts uh, any literally fucking any better than that Skippy segment right there. We're going to forever remember that as die Skippy segment. And it is officially fantasy football season. Our drafts are done. But you guys probably still have another four or five days until your drafts start. I promise you the best way, the single best way to prep for your draft this weekend is to download the underdog fantasy app and deposit 10 bucks to do three or four drafts on there when you hit that referral code page you're going to deposit the ten dollars and the next page is going to say who referred you you could throw bdge in there in the partner code i would very much appreciate that this is the final team we got russ and stafford as the quarterbacks running backs we got henry chris carson matt breda adrian peterson Darrell williams divino zigbo Wide receivers, Chris Godwin, Calvin Ridley, DK Metcalf, Deshaun Jackson, Curtis Samuel, Andy Isabella, Kendrick Bourne, tight ends, Darren Waller, Jared Cook, Irv Smith Jr. Not the worst, not the best, definitely not the best, but none of my teams ever fucking are, according to you guys. That's what we got. Again, go download the Underdog Fantasy app. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. And if you haven't copped the Big Dogs Draft Guide, that is probably the second best way to prepare for your drafts, okay? Um, I love y'all. And I'll see you on Faith the Public tomorrow.